right, questions? Yeah. What would you say to Bill Gates if he had the opportunity to talk to him? What would I say to Bill Gates if I had the opportunity to talk to him? Um, stop listening to Warren Buffett. Um, I don't know if you know, but Warren Buffett and Bill Gates have become very good friends. And Bill Gates uh, views Warren Buffett as a father figure. And Warren Buffett is the second richest man in the world, or the third richest, something like that. Right? And Warren Buffett is very, very corrupt intellectually. He is a student of a philosopher, a famous American philosopher by the name of John Rawls. I don't know if you're familiar with John Rawls. So Warren Buffett's, this is Warren Buffett's explanation for his wealth. I got lucky. I got lucky. So he believes that it's luck and that it wasn't anything to do with his ability, you know, his anything. He doesn't believe in free will at the end of the day. So he believes that he had the right genes, the right parents, and was born in the right century to take advantage of those genes and those parents to make the money that he did, right? He didn't choose anything. And Bill Gates has been very influenced like this. And, and Warren Buffett, as a consequence, um, always advocates for higher taxes out of guilt. Of course, he always finds ways not to pay them, but he advocates for them. Um, and Bill Gates has learned from him. So he used to be much better. And, and over the last 10, 15 years, he's been under Warren Buffett's influence and has become, I'd say, stop feeling guilty. Take pride in your achievements, which I think he has anyway. You can tell he's got a, he's got a sort of vibrancy to him, just like Steve Jobs used to have. You get a sense that this guy knows somewhere. But, he, but at the same time, he feels guilty. He's split. He's, he's contradicted. So what a, what a shame. I would, but at the end of the day, what I'd really tell Bill Gates is thank you. Because you know, whatever I paid for all the Microsoft products I bought all those years, and it's not that much because I'm an Apple guy, have been since 1989. It was hard. There were years where it was very hard to be an Apple person. Um, but I, I would say thank you, because whatever I paid for those products, it's a fraction of the value I got from them. And I think if we all had that attitude and we told the, the very successful businessman thank you, I think the world would be a much better place. And my question is actually also about uh, Bill Gates. Uh, you were saying that uh, if he wasn't focused on charity and he was just producing uh, yeah. like it was before, he would be helping more people, but uh, isn't that just up to him? You're assuming that he feels guilty, but maybe this is just what he wants to yeah. do. And he's just yeah, but I, I preface that by saying, selfish? yeah, I preface that by saying that when you watch him talking about his charity, eh, it's kind of okay. When you, talk him, when you watch him talking about investment, he lights up. He lights up. So I'm guessing, I don't know him, but, but I think it's a pretty good educated guess, given the culture, given everything. And given the Justice Department went after him, and given all the trials, that his attitude is, I need to do the charity to be, to be a good guy. But I love the investing. So you're and what I'm saying is, drop the unearned guilt. If you, if you really did something bad, you should feel guilty about it. But if you did something good, you shouldn't feel guilty about doing something good. He feels it. You can tell in his speeches, when he talks about it, like Warren Buffett. So, yeah, he's got a right to do whatever the hell he wants with his money, right? He could burn it. It's, it's, it's his money, right? But there's a difference between a political right and what I think is morally right. And morally, I think he's committed crime in a sense that he's not living to his full potential. He's not doing what he really wants to do. He's doing it based on a feeling of unearned guilt, based on false morality. Yeah, I'm going to go that way. How do you integrate external, externalities in your story? Like, so how, how do we deal with externalities, like? Yeah, the environment or like polluting. So the, the, the primary way to deal with externalities is to internalize them. The problem of externalities is that too much of our space is public. But if everything was private, and, and I like, you know, go all out. Say if the rivers were private, then nobody would pollute them because nobody pollutes my backyard, right? Because we have, we have law that is well established for hundreds, thousands of years, hundreds of years that says you can't put your garbage in my, if I owned a river, you couldn't pollute the river. Or if even if I owned a chunk of river, there's law that deals with all these things. It's sometimes messy and complicated, but there's a legal system exactly for that. 
if a factory over here spews stuff into the air that I can prove causes me harm, I'm getting sick, I have legal recourse against them. And if it's lots of factories clearly spewing out something that's causing harm to people in their lawsuits and there's medical proof, then sure, the government steps in and bans that because the government's responsibility is to protect individual rights. And if they're violating my rights by poisoning me, then they need to stop. Right? But that requires proof that real harm is being done to real individuals. Right? And that's not what happens today. What happens today is speculation about maybe this thing might one day be damaging to somebody. And it, it would probably require precedent in a court of law where there's actually, you show evidence. And, and a court would have to rule, yes, this is poison. And then the government would take into account and maybe ban the product. So that's how you would deal with it. But let me, let me, let me, let me say this. And you guys are all young, or most of you are young. Um, we live in the cleanest environment in human history. We live longer, healthier lives than any human beings have ever lived on planet Earth. The air you breathe, even in industrial Rotterdam, is cleaner than the air your ancestors breathed on farms where there was horse dung and manure everywhere. And they couldn't afford to clean. Who could afford? Who had money to clean? In London, in the 19th century, in the streets, what do you think was in the streets in London in the 19th century? What was the main mode of transportation? Horses. What did they, you ever been to Disneyland? In Disneyland, when they have a parade of horses, there's a guy on the back who runs after the horses. And every time they poop, he scoops it up and puts it in the bag. Right? Nobody scooped the horse dung in the streets of London. It piled up, which means the rats were there. It was filthy. And it stunk. And when we lived in caves, we burnt wood. You think that smoke was good for you? This is like amazing, the air quality we have today. Do you know why Europeans drink beer? Because the water used to be so filthy that they couldn't drink water. So they had to create a liquid that was not, that was drinkable, that did not have all the bacteria. The water did. And you know why the Chinese drink tea? Because tea makes sure that you boil the water. Because the water wasn't guaranteed to be safe. It was guaranteed not to be safe. Today, you open a faucet, and you drink, at least in the West. Wow. Clean water. It's amazing. Right? So stop worrying about the environment. It's great. It's doing really well. In America, there are more trees now than there were 200 years ago. And let me tell you this. There's a, this is a simple economic truth. Do you guys recycle paper? Everybody, everybody in the Netherlands recycles paper? I mean, you, a lot, right? You're killing trees. The more you recycle, the fewer trees there will be. The more you recycle paper, the fewer trees there will be. Now, I know that's mind-boggling, but think of it this way. If we stopped eating chicken tomorrow, would there be more chickens in the world or less chickens in the world? Less, because people would not farm chickens. They would all die, because we're not using them. They wouldn't use them. So when somebody goes into a plot of land and chops down trees, right? I usually do a, I don't have a uh, marker. Anyway, if somebody chops down trees, and they have to decide how many new trees to plant. They look at expected demand for wood products in the future. And if expected demand for wood products in the future is declining because of recycling, they turn that land into farmland, or they build homes on it, or they build a factory on it, they don't plant trees. But if they think demand for wood is going to increase in the future, because we're not recycling, then they're going to plant more trees than they were there before. Every tree that's chopped down in a world that consumes wood, a new tree is planted. So the number of trees in the US today is higher than it was 200 years ago because we consume more trees. Sorry, but what about the Amazon? 
we know that over 60% has been cut down. Because there's no private property in the Amazon. Nobody owns those trees. Nobody has an incentive to replant them because nobody can make a profit off of them. And it's exactly this issue. Since they can't sell the trees, what are they burning it down for? To use that land for something that they can make a living off of, which is what? Farmland. Because they're starving. Because the, 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 the indigenous people who have been, because of the states in Brazil, they've been impoverished. But imagine if, those, if, if the Amazon was privately owned. Then, then the private owner could decide what to do with it. But if there was demand for trees, which there is, they wouldn't burn them down. Burning them down is a stupid thing to do. There'd be more trees in the Amazon, not less. Every time you recycle paper, you're destroying a tree. I, it's not funny. I, this is reality, which nobody will teach you. But this is economics 101. It's a renewable resource. Therefore, it's, it, it, the number of it increases as we use it more, like chicken. The more we eat, the more chickens there are in the world. The less we eat, the fewer chickens there are in the world. You know how, you know how they're trying to save elephants in Africa? I can't remember if it's Kenya or Uganda, one of the places. They're actually being successful in saving elephants. How are they doing it? Making zones where they, people can hunt them. Yeah, providing an um, uh, uh, economic incentive to have lots of elephants. And one way is hunting. There are other ways to do it. But otherwise, poachers go in and they kill the elephants. Illegally, but they still do it. You can ban the killing of elephants, they still do it. But if you make it legal, then suddenly people have an incentive to have more elephants and to save the elephants. That's the reality. Elephants will disappear unless we privatize them. Privatize the elephants. Yeah. yeah. You, you want spotted owls? Buy some. And buy a forest and put them there. And they'll, they'll, they'll be safe because they'll be yours, and I won't have a right to take them from you. We know how to protect that right. Yeah, can we get back to, uh, uh, to Bill Gates once more? It's an interesting topic. Sure, one of my favorite topics. Um, I was just wondering, like, you said, like, Bill, Bill Gates could change the world possibly, like, four or five times yeah. again. But, like, if he incentivizes or, like, enables 50,000 people by his charity to do the same, like, wouldn't that provide a better result? Yeah, but that's not, the, that's not what charity does. What charity does... Well, it doesn't it? What's that? It doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, what does it then? Because, like... He, he's going to give, like, well, I know, don't know the numbers, but tens of thousands of people uh, the newest devices and the newest, like, educational stuff just to, to be able to work with them and create from there on, like... Uh, if, if he was investing his charity primarily in education, I would agree with you. I'd say, yeah, that's, that's probably really good, particularly if he knew what he was doing, which I'm not sure anybody does in education, but if he knew what he was doing, he's creating entrepreneurs of the future. Sure, but that's not what he's doing. Because that wouldn't get him the moral credits. That's a p small part of what he does. The real moral credits he gets from doing what? From flying to Africa and buying uh, 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 malaria tents. Now, I'm not against that. That's great. These people would be dead if not for him. Good for him, right? He's helping tens of thousands. But that doesn't change the world. And the fact is that you want to see the next world-changing technology, it's in Silicon Valley. It's in somebody your age starting a business that's going to be, what do they call them now, unicorns, right? The next unicorn or whatever. Now, you get that effect in education, and I am a huge believer in privatizing education and getting entrepreneurs like Bill Gates engaged in it so that we can create, so that more people have the tools to be able to create Microsofts in the future. Absolutely. That's a great investment. But what he loves is finding talented people and helping them start companies and, and create the next Microsoft. And he'd be really good at it. And it's a shame he's not doing more of that. Now, I, I mean, I don't want to argue about what Bill Gates should do with his life. That's not my point. My point is that he's not doing that for the wrong. It, it's it's, it's the, the unearned guilt is my point. The tragedy of the fact that he feels unearned guilt. What he does with his money at the end of the day is his choice. If he did it from purely devout of guilt reasons, then, you know, if he, if he decided that, that, you know what, I really enjoy going to Africa and, and, and helping these kids, and I'm, I'm really invested in this, and I love these people, and I want to help them, and this is great, then I would say, good for Bill Gates. But that's not the sense I get from him, right? That's not what he really wants to do. Okay, so that motivation comes above, like, the results of what he's... Oh, yeah, no, I, I'm all for your, you know, 
your selfish passion. What is, what is good for you, not what is good for other people. Now, if you do what's good for you, if you do what's good for you rationally, other people benefit. I can't think of a profession in which, but the standard is not other people. The standard is you. Again, you have one life on this earth. Make the most of it. And making the most of it affects other people for the positive. A, a society of selfish individuals is the most productive, most wonderful society imaginable. Because everybody wants to deal with one another as traders, win-win relationships. So everybody's winning constantly. Or they don't deal with one another. Or you walk away from the transaction. And that's true in personal life. Try, try uh, having a spouse and living your life with them on a win-lose relationship. Not going to work very well. Love is the most selfish thing you will ever do in your life. Love is the most selfish thing. Imagine if it was selfless. Honey, I'm marrying you tomorrow, but it doesn't mean anything to me. This is completely selfless. You don't really make me feel that good. <laughs> I mean, of course. The reason you marry somebody is because they make you feel wonderful. Because they make you feel wonderful. Because they're adding value to your life more than any other human being on the planet. That's love. That's selfish. Yeah. Um, you said we need a moral revolution. Yes. What does that mean? Does it only mean that being selfish is now moral and not immoral? Or is it not moral but also not immoral? Or it means that now morality only being selfless and not an ass on that? Yeah, so it means that, that um, the standard for morality is your own self-interest. Now, that's not enough. You have to articulate what self-interest means. You have to articulate a set of values and a set of virtues that match up. If you think about what Aristotle did, he tried to figure out this golden mean. I don't really believe in that. But you, you have to study it, and you have to figure out the details. Ayn Rand does that. And, and you, you know you can read that. She's got a book called The Virtue of Selfishness, where she does it. And you can agree or disagree. But the standard needs to be my life, my flourishing as a human being, and what are the virtues and values that lead to that. I think Ayn Rand's discovered them, saved us a lot of work. But instead of the, the, the motivation being selflessness or wanting a mixture of the two, you know, why mix poison with good food? I'm for good food. And self-interest is good. Self, being selfless is not good. So what I desire is good and the aversion is all Well, if it's rational. If your, what you desire is rational. Are humans rational enough to say that this whole system would work out at that point? I mean, it's, uh, just look around you. Everything, everything, think of, think of everything that works in, in this city or even in this classroom. And that was a rational mind that made that. Irrationality doesn't make any of this. Emotions doesn't produce a single thing in this room. So human beings are incredibly rational. It's what makes us human, not thumbs. We are, as Aristotle called us, the rational animal. The, what, what's uniquely now? Do people act rationally? Do people use their reason? No. But they haven't been taught to. They don't expect it to. Because morality has nothing to do with how you live your life. See, my morality says, if there's a commandment, the commandment is think. Most morality say sacrifice. You don't have to think to sacrifice. Sacrifice is easy. It's, a, it's an emotion. So a morality, a culture that is built around a morality that says reason is the most important thing in life. Think, use your tool, your mind. Elevates reason, elevates thinking, elevates rationality. Everybody can do it. The question is, does everybody do it? And, and we need to make it important so that everybody does do it. I think too many people don't use their mind. And the sad thing about that is the life that they are wasting for themselves. Most people drift through life. They just cruise. They're not happy. They're not particularly unhappy. They're just there. And I look at that and say, that's sad. They could be, you know, really living. I want you to really live. It's fun. And you only get one chance. You don't get two. One. So make the most of it. Yep. And you, you're talking about uh, the moral revolution. I was wondering, um, how do you think you could start something like that here in Europe? Because you know, in the United States, uh, the morality is more closer to something. Yeah, it is a little bit. Yeah, Europeans have a harder time. Um, although Eastern Europeans, not so much, because they know 
what the other morality taking the extreme is exactly like, what it, what it exactly means. When, when everything is shared and everybody is sacrificed, they know what that means. Um, it's all about education. It's all about talking. It's all about writing. It's all about speaking. It's all about engaging with people. It, it, there's no shortcuts in life. There's no flip of a switch. This is hard. Any intellectual battle is hard. A, intellectual battle that's asking people to reconsider their morality after 2,000 years of indoctrination, very, very hard. Uh, even though Europe has abandoned the Christian religion, it has embraced full-heartedly the Christian ethics. We are, Europe is a Christian uh, a, a continent in ethics. And, and what you're asking them is to give up on Jesus. Because our moral ideal, and I, can say, I can't say this in America because they'll lynch me, right? <laughs> this is advantage of Europe. The moral ideal we have is a guy dying the worst possible death imaginable. This is like torture, the worst torture you could imagine, nailed to a cross. Not for sins he committed, for sins we committed. That's really bad. I don't like that. So it was a lot, a lot of work to do. Yeah. In a capitalist system, property rights are important. And I'm using a euphemism. Yeah. Um, I've got a moral dilemma. Okay. Uh, property rights are important. Yes. But when you have a person who gets a self-esteem and self-worth from cheating and stealing from others, yep. uh, and the law says you can't cheat or you can't steal, yep. Yep. Uh, is it moral to get into prison? Yes, absolutely. So first of all, uh, he, there's something wrong with this person. He's abnormal. Uh, he, he's, he's, he's sick in some way. Anybody who gets, no, it, he's not being selfish. And I, and I explained why being selfish is primarily being rational. And being rational means that lying, stealing, and cheating does not provide self-esteem. Does not. And you, you can read up in psychology. You know, this is, this is not hypothetical. When you read about uh, uh, psychopaths, people who lie, steal, and cheat and don't care, right, because they have no what people call consciousness. They are miserable. They are haters. They don't enjoy life. There's no eudemonia. There's no flourishing. There's no happiness. They're miserable, pathetic human beings. Now, in the movies, we can create romanticized villains. There are no romantic villains in real life. Villains are ugly, miserable, sad human beings. That's because that's how we're built. That's the nature of how human beings function. It's because we rely on reason. And if you don't believe me, try it sometime. And it has, it's, it's A is A. This is the impact it has. So now there are people who are sick. The people who enjoy, you get pleasure out of torturing people. And I consider them sick. I consider them abnormal. It's the responsibility of all of us to put those people away so that they don't hurt us. The fact that they're getting pleasure of something is does not excuse our sacrifice in, in keeping them around so that they can torture us. So you get rid of them. You, you, you put them in jail. It's, it, nobody would have qualms about doing that. And, and you know, it could be a mistake. Somebody could misinterpret, like you do, that selfishness means lying, stealing, or cheating, and they could go and do it. I'm still going to put them in jail. I don't care if it's because they're bad people or because they misinterpret it. You violate somebody else's rights, you go to jail because rights are the fundamental principle, which means no coercion. It's the fundamental principle in a social environment because that's the only way to protect the ability of good people to pursue their happiness, to pursue the values that they have. Yeah, well, I find it strange that you think that you have the wisdom to say to from another person who really enjoys or is really... I don't care, is my okay, point. you don't care, but I find this... No, but I don't care if they get the pleasure, but I also can tell I, I have the wisdom and I have the knowledge. I'm a little older than you, and I've seen the world, and it does, it does mean a lot, actually, because experience in life means a huge amount. That's fine. You, you, I was, when I was 24, I thought exactly like you do uh, about, about the fact that wisdom doesn't accumulate over time, but it does. Um, it doesn't matter, but at the end of the day, politically, in terms of putting him in jail, it doesn't matter whether they are happy or not. If they violate rights, they go to jail. Because my concern is with rational people. And if he is interfering in the ability of rational people to live their life by using force, he goes to jail. And, but I can also tell you, psychologically, 
He's a miserable, pathetic human being. Don't believe me, that's fine. I, I have no problem with that. Um, just the last statement, I have two problems with that. The first one yes. is, um, in the case of Enron, I yes. get the management of Enron wasn't too unhappy with what they did. And well, they were very, they were, they were very unhappy, but... Uh, they are billionaires, so I don't know how, how unhappy you can be. Since when is money, the, uh, a, a money a measure of happiness? So let me give you an example that I know, right? and we can talk about Enron too, because I know a little bit about Enron as well. Bernie Madoff, everybody know Bernie Madoff? Bernie Madoff created a pyramid scheme. Um, he, stole, he stole this money, he became very, very wealthy. I don't know if a billionaire, but the Enron guys weren't billionaires. They were hundreds of millions. They were very rich. And um, he had this amazing pyramid scheme. He was living the good life. And he was caught, like all of them were caught, like the Enron guys were caught, right? And he says today, in prison, happier than he's ever been. Happier than he's ever been. Happier than, much happier than he was when he was stealing the money. Why? Because when he's stealing the money, a, he had no self-esteem because he knew he was relying on deception in order to gain any kind of value, which is self-destructive. But second, he was constantly looking over his shoulder, not because he worried about the police. He was worried that his best friends would find out. He was worried that his family would find out. And indeed, who discovered Bernie Madoff? It wasn't the stupid regulators. Who discovered Bernie Madoff? His son, who turned him into the police. And a year after his son discovered it, he committed suicide. Even after his son committed suicide, he's still happier today in jail than he was before. He couldn't sleep because he was constantly worried about being caught. Again, not by the police, by the people he was stealing money from. He couldn't have a relationship with another human being. Why? Because he was lying. Now, I don't know how much, this is an example of age, right? I don't know how many relationships you guys have had, intimate relationships with other human beings, sexual, romantic, and non-romantic. But if you lie, that relationship will not survive, not because the other person will catch it, but because you can't look them in the eye. Because your relationship is built on a falsehood, and you know it. Now, the older you get, the more relationship you have, the more you can induce this particular truth. One way in which we gain wisdom with age. Um, but, so, Money is not that, even a Marxist believe that money is happiness. Money is not happiness. I, I could have, I, I've got a PhD in finance. I could have gone to Wall Street and made millions of dollars. I don't want to do that. Because I don't want, the money is not that important to me. I'd much rather do this. This is more fun than making money. For me. Not for somebody else. Who each have our own values. So I chose to be poorer, not poor, but poorer <laughs> than I otherwise would be because of my values. So it's not about money. The Enron guys, A, they were caught. They suffered en enormously. I know uh, at least two of the guys. But B, these guys were schmoozing political types. They weren't the kind of, they didn't have the, the sense that you get from a Bill Gates or Steve Jobs or, 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 you know, because they didn't create the wealth. It was all haggling, political haggling. It wasn't even business haggling. You know? It's like Donald Trump. Take a, take a current example. You look at Donald Trump. Can you say if Donald Trump has high self-esteem or low self-esteem? Very low. Very low. Well, how do you know? Because anybody criticizes him. He's got, got like the thinnest skin. If you have self-esteem and somebody criticizes you, what's your response? There's one of two options. The person who criticized you is right. And if he's right, you should thank him. Because now you, you know better. The second option is he's wrong. And if he's wrong, why do you care? He's wrong, not you, you're right. That's self-esteem. When you have low self-esteem, when somebody criticizes you, you punch him in the nose. That's Donald Trump, right? Now, Donald Trump has no self-esteem. He, he exudes this false confidence. But that thin skin is an example of an unhappy, miserable, no self-esteem type of person. You can tell these things about people. It's not that hard. And, and you can see, he's not a thinker. I don't think he uses many of the cells inside there. <laughs> and, and that's partially why he has low self-esteem. Yeah? Uh, it's true that uh, entrepreneurial minds are great wealth, but uh, in the end of the day, it helps everyone, but it, the wealth is not really distributed equally, and then creates further, bigger uh, uh, inequality. Yeah. But why is inequality a bad thing? I think inequality is wonderful. Um, Think about what inequality represents, right? If, we, if you take a group like this group, we're all different. Everybody in this room is different. You all look different. 
I'm sure you've all got different talents and different skills. You know, you, you're going to do things differently. Some of you will be great teachers. Some of you will be great business people. Some of you will be great entrepreneurs. You'll all be different. Some of you do technology. Some of you do healthcare. I don't know, right? Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that amazing? And yeah, you'll create different world levels of wealth. Who cares? Why does that matter? You're not stealing from one another. Wealth is created. Wealth is additive. There's no fixed pie. And if I get a big one, you get a small one. If I bake a big pie and you bake a little pie, why is that a bad thing? And why do you have a right to take some of my big pie if I baked it? It's mine. So there's no social pie that we then divvy up. There's your pie and your pie and my pie and her pie. That's the pies. And we each have, and we bake different flavors of pie, different sizes of pie, different colors of pies. Light. So my point, my point is this, inequality is a feature of freedom. Anytime you give people freedom, they become unequal. It's not a bug, it's a feature. So when were we all poor? When we were all equal, when we were unfree. When you allowed us to be free, we became all rich, some richer than others. Wonderful. As I said, Bill Gates got 70 billion by making my life better. I love billionaires I, who make it honestly. I don't like the guys from Enron. But I love billionaires because the only way to make money is by making my life better. That's great. Yeah. What happens to people who are not rational? Because there are a lot of studies that show that people don't choose according to rationality, yep. but there is not perfect information. There's never perfect information, and one of, the, one of the beauties of markets is that markets work to reduce information inequalities. So um, you, get, you get whole industries that are created in order to teach you about things that you don't know, provide you information you don't know. Um, and when we restrain markets, we actually get more information asymmetries than when we allow markets to flourish. But what do we do with people who are not rational? Well, first, we expect them to be rational. See, in the world we live in today, we don't have that expectation. I'm talking about a moral expectation to be rational. It's morally a virtue to be rational. But secondly, if they're really not rational, and I, I, it, it depends on why they're not rational. If they, if they really don't have the ability to be rational, they're born with uh, uh, a defective, you know, uh, what do you call it now? Uh, a challenged brain, right? They just don't have the IQ to be rational. Um, IQ is a bad measure, but whatever the number is, whatever the, 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 the measure is, then they're going to rely on other people. They're going to rely on charity. They, you know, they have no choice. They, get, they rely on other people anyway. It's just in the welfare system, we coerce other people to help them. And in a charity system, people help them voluntarily. And I think. There's such a small number of those people that we would help them voluntarily because we're nice people. At the end of the day, we're pretty benevolent. Selfish people are the nicest people in the world. Because you know what? If I love my own self, if I love my life, if I want the best life that I can have for me, I look at you and I see reflections in a sense of me. I see other human beings. I love you guys because you have potential to make my life much, much better. Some of you might cure cancer. Some of you might start a new business that I will benefit from. And even if you never did, just the fact that you're alive is kind of cool. There are other human beings out there. I love it. I mean, we care about pets and plants. We water the plants and we pet our pets. Human beings are much more interesting than pets. We care about them a lot more. So charity, and this is, again, a European thing. Europeans don't do charity. Americans are very generous. Why? Because Americans are free and they're more selfish. The more selfish you are and the more free you are, the more charitable you are. Now, if people choose not to be rational, if people have the capacity but choose not to use it, which I think is most people today, that's their problem. Don't they need a certain amount of capacity to use it? 99.999% of the hu people on the planet Earth have the capacity to be rational. Whether they choose to do it is a different question. Whether we incentivize them to do it is a different question. Whether we encourage them to do it is a different question, but they have the ability to do it. You don't need much. And, and, and to, you know, it's very demeaning to say, oh, those people, they can't think. I can think, but they can't think. It's just not true. People's IQ, for example, changes over, to, over life. Uh, 
culture is affected. But IQ is not a good measure anyway. I know people who measure low in IQ and are really smart. So it, it, it's about do you engage your mind in dealing with reality, in integrating the facts around you? And everybody can do that. Again, the different levels. That's why some people are really, really rich, and some people will be middle class, some people will be relatively poor. But in a free society, people who are relatively poor are relatively rich compared to any other society. That's why the poor in America have air conditioning, they have cars, they have iPhones, but they're poor. Because if you have a bell curve, somebody has to be in the bottom 20% or the bottom 10%, right? But the bell curve is so far towards wealth that, you know, we have to go. Okay. Maybe a couple of, I haven't asked, I haven't taken any questions from here. Were there any? <laughs> there weren't any. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so you're next. You go, and then him. Okay. So there are many examples of uh, countries with a relatively free market doing very well. Why do you think that in the West we're more moving away from a very capitalistic system more towards regulation? For the reasons I, my whole speech was about. <laughs> because... We hold an ethical system that's incompatible with free markets because we believe in the nobility of sacrifice and selflessness. And we watch these businessmen and we say they're immoral and we need to control them. So it's not about the economics. The economics, there is no, there's no question about the economics. But it's about the morality. We believe that people who are pursuing their own self-interest are immoral. So we don't trust them. We don't trust entrepreneurs. We don't trust businessmen. We want to control them. We want to regulate them. But I would still assume that most policymakers are still fairly rational people, so they should also make the same conclusions. Well, you're, you, you're making a weird assumption. I, I know a lot of politicians. I've never met one who I would say was rational. They're power lusters. They want, the people who go into politics want to control you. The kind of people we elect to politics are the kind of people we want to control. They want to manipulate. They want to be overlords. That's their psychology. That's who they are. That's why you know, it's very rare to meet a happy politician. Um, it's because they're not motivated by, by good virtues. They're not motivated by good stuff. They're motivated by bad stuff. They're about power. They're not about truth. They're not about truth. I don't know a politician who's about truth. I mean, there might be. There are exceptions. They're here and there. There are a few. I'm not a big Ron Paul fan for a variety of reasons. Uh, and, I, and I don't think he is. No, if you look at politicians, what they're about, if you look at, if you look at uh, Hillary Clinton, what did she want? She wanted power. Did she believe in anything? Really believe in anything? No. She wanted power. She loves the idea of being president of the United States and be able to pull strings and manipulate you guys. That's what she, that's what she gets her kicks out of. Not healthy kicks, not happiness, kicks. You know, perverted kicks. Right? And what is, what is Donald Trump? Does Donald Trump... You know, what is, is, is the, what's this about? This is about Donald Trump being able to put his big name on the White House. The whole climate debate, the whole yeah. climate debate is not about facts. Or yeah, this whatever. stuff it's is not about, about facts. Politicians spending your money on, on all the crazy things. It's not about facts. It's not about them wanting to know. It's the not facts. about science. They, you know, they're not interested in these things. Not at all. But is selfishness not about getting power and becoming powerful? No, that's what I tried to explain. I tried to explain that selfishness is exactly the opposite of that. Selfishness is about being rational and pursuing rational values, values that actually enhance human life. And power does not. Power over other people does not enhance your life. It actually makes your life worse, not better. Uh, power over reality, over your reality, being able to control your situation, that gives you, gives you self-esteem. But, but if you, you are a self-respecting human being, then you have to respect other people. Because other people need to be self-respecting human beings as well. Having power over them is demeaning to them and by definition demeaning to you. You can't have, I can't say self-respect is important universally, but only I should have it. That's nuts. If you believe self-respect is a universal value, Right? Reason is a universal value. Then you have to respect it in every human being around you. And abusing other people undercuts your very argument about self-respect. So you can't even respect yourself. This is why people who are powerless, again, are not flourishing human beings. But then you should also respect people who are irrational, right? Yeah, I respect them. I leave them alone. I, I, I just don't want to, if they're irrational, they have no value to me. 
because they're not creating values right for me. So I leave them alone. I have no interest in them. It's not that I disrespect them or I, 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 I do bad things to them. I just, they're not affecting me, and, and therefore I leave them alone. But don't expect me to fund them. Don't take my money and give it to them, right? If they choose to be irrational, fine. Let them go and live their lives. So I, I'm not insisting everybody live like me. I'd like them to. I think it's good for you. But you can live your own life as long as you don't expect me to subsidize it. All right. Yeah. Well, let's take this, and then we have to run. You said at some point that the crisis from 2008 was caused. Oh my God! A short, a short question you're asking me. <laughs> Maybe by uh, too much um, rules and regulations, and didn't really get to a train of thought there. Yeah. So uh, I recommend you. I mean, the two books I recommend. One is my book called Free Market Revolution. Another one is a book by John Allison. Um, what was it called? Do you remember? Financial crisis. Financial crisis, only about financial crisis. But this is the outline. In, in, this is the, the really quick outline. What's that? We all have an event about this exit. Good. But here's the outline. In uh, 2002, the Federal Reserve under Alan Greenspan decides they don't want a recession. They lower interest rates below the rate of inflation. Negative real interest rates. Now, today we think that's cool, but, in, but, but it's not good. That created huge liquidity in the market. Lots of money slushing around. Artificially, bubbly, right? All of that money went into housing. Why did it all get into, go into housing? Because the American government was heavily, heavily, heavily subsidizing housing. Through Freddie and Fannie and through the tax system and through the Community Reinvestment Act, they were heavily subsidizing housing. Why did banks get in, involved in really risky transactions that, that were not going to last very long and they were going to lose money at some point? Because they had too big to fail. So they knew that they would get all the rewards, and when they failed, the government would bail them out. That's regulation. That's a bad incentive. And I could go on and on and on in the thousand different ways regulation caused this crisis. So if you think of like credit default swaps, for example? There's nothing wrong with credit default swaps. Credit default swaps are fabulous. They were abused. They were abused because there was an incentive. Basel II, I'll give you an example. Basel II. Wait, credit default swaps. OK, credit default swaps, for example, are wonderful instruments. They're an insurance policy. I buy a bond, and I'm worried that there's some probability this bond will default because the company will go bankrupt. I buy a credit default swap, and if the bond defaults, I get compensated for it. Nothing wrong with that. The credit default swap market did not create the crisis. It didn't cause the crisis. It didn't make the crisis worse. I thought you meant uh, the other one, the not the credit default swaps, the collateralized debt obligations, CDOs. Again, there's nothing wrong with a CDO, but they were done badly because there was an incentive to shovel out as many as possible because Freddie and Fannie were buying anything because they were being subsidized, but they were told by the government that they had to have, I can't remember, a certain percentage of all the you know, low-income mortgages in the United States. And it, so. At every, I can, you, I've literally done a six-hour course on the financial crisis that I've delivered. Every time you peel the onion on a different aspect of the crisis, what you discover are bad incentives created by regulation, bad regulations, and, 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 and bad central banking. And the other element is uh, what happened in 08 is that the policymakers panicked. Polson and Bernanke panicked. And everybody saw them panic. And they said, if Paulson and Bernanke are panicked, that means the government doesn't know what it's doing. That means we're in for a hard time. And the market went like that. It wasn't Lehman Brothers collapse that caused the market to collapse. It was the fact that Paulson went to Congress and said, the world's going to end unless you give me $700 billion, which in the law, it says he can do whatever he wants with. That's crazy. So again, there's a million examples of this, but that's this. The essential is government screwed up big time. And that's the same cause as the Great Depression. If you go back to the Great Depression, it was government that caused the Great Depression from beginning to end. Stock markets go down. When stock markets go down a lot, that doesn't cause a Great Depression unless the government reacts badly, which is what the government did. Thank you. After this event, we will go to the sports cafe to have a few drinks and to discuss uh, this event furthermore. Uh, I would like to say for starters that as Rotterdam students for liberty, uh, the speech of Jaron is not 
necessarily our own view. Uh, I think it's not, it's not your view at all. But we would like to have this discussion going on. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you all for being at our first event. Um, we're delighted to see that so many people are interested in such a controversial topic. And I'll start it with um, Rotterdam Students for Liberty. Now, you might be wondering, what is Rotterdam Students for Liberty? So I'll give you guys a short introduction. Um, Rotterdam Students for Liberty um, promotes personal liberty, and we try to empower students uh, with academic events, leadership training, and uh, uh, social um, events, which I will talk about later. And Rotterdam Students for Liberty is part of uh, a global network which is called Students for Liberty. And um, there are actually three main principles that Students for Liberty uh, tries to, uh, to sell, basically. Um, it's a social freedom, which for example means that you have, can do whatever you want to do without being constrained. So say for example that two people, two people of the same sex should be able to walk hand in hand on the streets. Um, yeah, okay. Secondly, um, intellectual and academic freedom. And lastly, economic freedom, which for example means that people should be able to pursue whatever job they would like without being constrained. So Students for Liberty is a global network and it has around 1900 local groups around the world on every single continent. And uh, Rotterdam Students for Liberty is one of those local groups. Um, and Students for Liberty actually provides a great opportunity, which is called the leadership, um, the local coordinator program. And in the local coordinator program, they actually teach you leadership qualities and uh, if, um, topics such as social change, communication, marketing, um, activism will be discussed in this in this um, local coordinator program. Also, with the local coordinator program, you can travel for free to conferences, which every local um, group of students for liberty um, organizes and in these um, conferences you will create a global network with people who have the same values and the same interests as you have. So rather than students for liberty tries to focus on um, making uh, academic events such as lectures, debates and panels. Also we try to focus on leadership training so as the local coordinator program for which you can apply a leadership forum and some workshops. And lastly, the social events, which are pub crawls, weekend trips, dinners, and movie, movie evenings. So, uh, the European Students for Liberty will also organize a conference, which is in Prague, and it's on the 17th and 19th of March. So, what is next? Um, we have a few events already coming up, which is next week we will visit the cinema to see the new Snowden movie. Not that new anymore. Um, also, an uh, event about the financial meltdown, where you just asked a question about. And um, we'll show a movie here as well. Then, Bit Nation, which is an online nation without borders. And um, actually, <coughs> the, the person who uh, made this site lives in Amsterdam and will visit. Then, of course, the conference of faith. And the free market roadshow, where there will be different panels and uh, workshops talking about the world after Brexit and Trump, and much more. So uh, because we are kind of a startup, sort of student association, we look for new people, and uh, maybe you can be the new leader in Liberty. Thank you very much. I am uh, Lech Cornelis. I am the president of the JOVD Rijnland, the uh, Rotterdam branch of the uh, youth uh, organization of the Dutch Youth Hall Party. Uh, I'm very proud to have worked with Rotterdam Students for Liberty on their first event, uh, organizing this great uh, lecture by uh, Jaron Broek. Uh, whereas uh, Rotterdam Students for Liberty is dedicated to liberty as a concept, uh, JVD Rijnmond is uh, dedicated to influencing politics, uh, especially through influencing our, our mother party. Um, one really important thing about our organization is that we are politically independent from our mother party, uh, which means we can make up statements uh, all the way we want, um, uh, which allows us to become sort of a moral compass for uh, Dutch politics. Uh, and this can be quite handy because, you know, our, our liberal party can sometimes be quite conservative, uh, quite interested in more real politics instead of uh, in, you know, more liberty-minded uh, issues. 
Um, and in the past, this has paid off for our organization. So, uh, for, for example, in the 70s, uh, the JRPD has allowed uh, our country, which was then ruled for, uh, mostly by Christian parties, uh, to institute as the first country in the world uh, gay marriage as a legal thing. Uh, nowadays, we are slowly making moves towards convincing our model party to legalize weed at the former uh, last uh, the party congress. We managed to make some steps uh, towards that. Uh, the JOVD also is a very uh, cozy organization. I think the word gezellig, which some international people here uh, know, really applies to, uh, to what we are about. Uh, we have lots of drinks, uh, lots of speakers who come to visit our city and to talk with us. Uh, these are often really prominent politicians. Like lot, two weeks ago, we had uh, a Dutch uh, former speaker of the house, Nuska from Miltenburg, uh, from Miltenburg. And in January, we'll have the defense minister, uh, Janine Hennis. And uh, this is a really great opportunity to network with these people on a personal level, because these people are often really inaccessible. If we make them uh, really, really approachable, just, you're sitting in like this kind of setting with people who are actually in power. Uh, which is a great network opportunity. I've seen lots of people have met internships or even jobs through these kinds of opportunities. So, um, to summarize, what the JOVD has to offer is well, in-depth political activities, great people to get to know. I mean, uh, Stevie's also a member, so you get her in the, both the deals. Uh, uh, what we offer, and we offer great networking uh, uh, opportunities uh, within politics. Uh, there's also another more external and more selfish reason, and we all love selfish uh, things after the speech by uh, Mr. Brook. Uh, this is what I got here, this is a knackpot. It uh, can give you all kinds of discounts in Rotterdam, at bars, clubs, restaurants, shops, you name it. Um, normally it costs 15 euros, but if you become a member of the JOD for just 5 euros, uh, we can give you one for free. Uh, there's a limited supply, so be, be quick about it if you want to. Uh, if you want to become a member, if you are interested, you can just speak to me here or at the drinks afterwards, and, or you can simply fill out one of these uh, blue little forms I'll show them to you, and uh, we'll, we'll get you, uh, we'll get you uh, going. Uh, so that was uh, most of my pitch. I want to thank you very much for visiting, and I hope to see you uh, soon. Uh, thank you.